questions, especially those that we're not able to get to, and we can send out additional information as we go through. So again, please make sure your phone is muted and use the chat feature for any questions. Otherwise, I will turn it over to our expert panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is John, John Newman. I'm one of the general surgeons with kind of Advocate Aurora, but I also help lead the the hospital in Oshkosh and soon to be the hospital in Fond du Lac. And, and so for the last, gosh, almost a year and a half, we've been watching this virus and, and how it's behaving and been concerned and actually some of our fears actualized. And in Northeast Wisconsin, I think everybody knows that in March, April, it was just kind of passing over us. We had a few cases here and in, in, in the Appleton, the Fox Cities, Oshkosh, and Fond du Lac, but it wasn't what I would say is really bad in March and April. With um, but then we got into the fall, and for us, it got pretty bad. It got pretty bad for all Northeast Wisconsin to the point where, you know, we weren't stacking them up in the hallways. But I tell you what, we had made some places in the hospitals that, quite frankly, had never really had patients as as inpatient rooms before, and so we used every bit of space in our hospitals. And I would say that the health systems did a remarkable job. I mean, we were calling St. Agnes, St. Agnes was calling Theta, Theta was calling Ascension, and we were collaborating, working together to figure out, all right, here's what's happening tonight, not this month, not this week, but tonight, and how do we take care of our patients? Because we were getting a lot of referrals and patients coming down from the Rhineland or Eagle River, Sturgeon Bay area, where they just don't have inpatient capacities. <clears throat> so for those two, two and a half months, we were tied as a tick. And, and then it gradually started coming down. And, and it started coming down really, one, I, I don't know if there's a natural history of waves through communities, or if there's a natural response of communities to to behavior such as hand washing and masking and social distancing that just make all the difference in the world. I think someday we'll get a chance to look back on it, but right now in Northeast Wisconsin, we're in a pretty good spot. I would say between Marinette, uh, Manitowoc, uh, Bay Care up in Green Bay, Oshkosh, uh, we probably have 30 patients, you know, that are COVID positive, sick in the hospitals compared to you know, mid 200s where we were at before. And so now we come upon this time where we've got this, these vaccinations and the vaccinations offer us a lot of help and a lot of hope, but that we've got these variants coming and we'll talk a little bit about what these variants mean to us and, and, and what we can do. I guess probably the most important message I'd like to share is if this is a, a baseball game, uh, I think we're at the bottom of the third, the top of the fourth. All right, I don't think we're at the bottom of the eighth, top of the ninth. And so we've got a whole lot more to learn as we go through. I really appreciate, and you sent over some questions that you guys had. And I think these are phenomenal, thoughtful questions. And it's always interesting when you get a different population because last week I was talking to the school districts and really it was a lot of questions about pregnancy and fertility. But when you, you know, when I'm looking at the questions from the employers, it's really questions about how to deal with our teams and our, and our employees and our corporations. And so I appreciate that. So, you know, I, I appreciate Kim and Danielle partnering with me. Kim, Danielle, anything you guys would say to that as we start talking about vaccinations? No, I, I mean, I think you hit on it pretty well. You know, we aren't, you know, at the end game just because we're talking about vaccinations, you know, all of those mitigation strategies that we know work when it comes to that keeping your distance, face coverings, um, staying home when you're sick, disinfection, you know, all of those pieces play a huge role. And then when we start now talking about vaccination, you know, it isn't that because vaccination is available to a couple groups here, we can now stop doing all of those mitigation strategies we know work. So I think we've got a pretty good job vaccinating our frontline healthcare workers, our EMS teams, our police departments, our dentists in the community, the, the, the private doctors in the community. And now the past week we've been, we've been vaccinating our 65 and older. And I will tell you that if you get a chance, boy, you go down to those vaccination clinics and, and I was with an 88 year old lady yesterday who was just in tears. She was so happy that she was getting this vaccine and what that she was gonna get back from just one small component of life, not having this sort of Damocles hanging over her head that, hey, you know, I, I could be taken out by COVID. On the other hand, there's a lot of 
you know, your friends and my friends that are 65 and older who had COVID and kind of the questions you guys have brought up here, great questions. So I'll just start off with the questions because I don't think, Joe, there's any way to get through all your questions, even in the time we've got, but we'll try and weave them into the fabric of the discussion. And, and one of the first ones, if someone's already had COVID, don't they naturally build up the same immunity as vaccination, which is introducing the virus? And do they really need to be vaccinated? And the answer to that, I think, is yes. With um, We do know that when people get really rather sick with COVID, it's because the virus actually suppresses their immunity. And while it's suppressing their immunity, it takes the opportunity to make them even sicker. And so as it's suppressing their immunity, it actually you know, suppresses some of their body's ability to, to create an immune response, which is why people get pretty doggone sick sometimes with COVID and why it's some people just get a little sick and some people get a lot sick. I think right now, the, the best news that I can tell you is we're not seeing a lot of people across America and we're well into a year in this, right? So it's not like when it first started Washington State that now we're seeing a bunch of people in Washington State with a second bout of COVID. We are seeing some people with the second hit of COVID, but the reality is those are folks that are on chemotherapy, immunosuppressants, or there's something significantly going on with their immune systems that put them or we put them at a disadvantage. And so when you have the virus and you're sick from it, you're actually immunosuppressed, which is why you're sick. And, and when you get the vaccine, the vaccine isn't the virus, right? It's just right now, it's just one messenger RNA code that makes for the spike protein. And so here's my COVID virus. This red thing is the spike protein. So the messenger RNA just makes for this spike protein. And so when I get this shot in my arm, the muscles in my arm make this spike protein and my body says, hey, that's different. Let me make an antibody for that. And it does that. So that two weeks from now, when I actually see COVID and COVID has a spike protein, my antibodies are already there to capture it and to kill it. And the one advantage we have right now is, so, so I see Zach on the phone. So Zach, if, if I gave you COVID today, it's probably four to six days before you're really getting sick. And so in that four to six days, if we've given you a vaccine, that's plenty of time for your body to capture and kill the virus that's in there. Now, some influenzas, you know, Kathy, if I gave you influenza today, some of those influenzas, you're sick by tonight. And so it's a lot harder for a vaccine to kick up into that high gear when it's only got 12 hours to work with them. But this particular virus, we've got about a four to six day of that prodrome period where our immune systems, if primed, can do a pretty good job. And so right now, the big question people are having is if I get the Pfizer or the Moderna and we're looking just at the messenger RNA that was coded for this, is that going to protect me from the South African, South American, B117, the UK variant. And it seems to be the case with them, but our biggest concern is if one of these mutations happens, it can happen and it could change the spike protein to where our antibodies don't completely recognize it. And so I would say if you've had COVID, your body's going to have some of that innate you know, memory against that spike protein as well as the virus, but the vaccine may give you an augmented, you know, against the spike protein, and it may give you protection against one of these variants that perhaps will emerge in the future. So I would still get the vaccine. And if you were sick with the virus versus asymptomatic, does it mean you have more immunity? You know, we're not seeing people that are getting secondary COVID to really say, well, this person was asymptomatic and they're getting it again, or this person was really sick, they're getting it again. So I think we've still got a good memory and immunity. And remember how herd immunity works, folks, is once you get exposed to either the vaccine or the virus, then you're likely to be re-exposed somewhere in the community, but you may not have gotten sick. But in that re-exposure, you do reprime your immune system to say, oh, I remember this. Let's build this up just in case we see it again. How long does a natural immunity from you know, having the virus actually last? I don't think anybody knows this. You know, we've tested, you know, these antibodies and we've tested, you know, memory for this. But sometimes people who've been sick with COVID, we can't even find these antibodies at three months. But I don't, I don't honestly think that matters a whole lot because they're not getting COVID again, right? And so what I really care about are the people that were sick, are they getting COVID again? And the reality is they're not. And so if they're not, I think we can at least say we've got protection for about a year. 
And so did those people who got it last February also see, you know, the COVID again in June and July and reprime their immune system so they get another year and maybe saw it again over Christmas and reprime it another year? Who knows? And so when we start having a lot of people with secondary infections, like I had COVID two years ago, now I got it again, that's when we'll truly know the natural immunity to this. Danielle, Kim, would you guys answer that one any differently? I wouldn't, no. And so how long does the immunity from the vaccination last? Well, these, these, are, these are under emergency use authorization, which means for the Pfizer or the Moderna, they had two month data of safety and efficacy. And, and quite honestly, the safety was pretty remarkable. A few sore arms, a few red spots, a few uh, significant reactions, but very, very, very few. And so when we talk about the vaccinations, with um, what we've seen is that the immunity for them certainly lasted the two months before they presented their data to the emergency use team, with them, but we don't know. Now we've got four month data from the, from the Pfizer and the Moderna, and next month, guess what? We'll have five month data. So we'll get smarter and smarter, older and older data to really check the immunity. But again, the true question is, not if I can measure antibodies, because I would say that that has never been something that we had the greatest of confidence in, meaning we have a lot of people who had COVID and we can't measure antibodies in, but it's not like they're getting COVID a second time. And so there is some memory built within our T cells and our B cells that is not something we can measure in an antibody. All right, will we be required <clears throat> to get the vaccination annually, like the flu shot. Kim, Danielle, what do you guys think? You know, we're hearing that it is likely um, that it could be, you know, six months to a year that it would be that recommendation to get either, you know, a booster. But that is not anything that the state is, you know, willing to put any specific time points on yet, but they said it could be likely. You know, the reason we do an annual influenza is because flu does mutate, you know, and, but flu usually gives us a mutation of about one to two mutations a year. And so for that, then we probably change the structure of the flu vaccine about every other year that actually is a different vaccine for us. And, and you guys know, sometimes we have a really great year with the flu vaccine, and sometimes it seems to be not so great. Let's don't forget that the value of the flu vaccine, much like the value of the COVID vaccine is one, it prevents us from getting the disease. So not getting COVID and not getting the flu is a good thing. But probably what's more important is the people that get the flu vaccine. And even out of the five to 10% of the people that had the COVID vaccine and got COVID, none of them had to go into the hospital. And so I actually think it's that 10% of people that got COVID after the vaccine who didn't have to go to the hospital that is the more important number than the 90% of them that didn't even get COVID. Now, we would have taken a 50%, right? That would have been, if it just helped half the people, we'll take it. But the 10% of the people that it seemed to not completely protect still protected from keeping them out of the hospital, which is why we push the flu vaccine every year. It's not that we don't think some people can't get a little sick from the flu, but they don't get sick and come into the hospital and die with the flu. And so the flu right now changes about one to two mutations a year. The thing that is making us a bit concerned is some of these variants have got up to 25 different mutations. And 25 mutations in a virus in a year is rather significant. And so that's what our concern is. With, with a virus that's got this much capacity to mutate, you know, it can mutate to a completely wimpy virus, which would be great. We never hear from it again. But the ones that we're going to hear from are the ones that mutate to something that's a little bit more aggressive. And certainly the UK variant seems to be easily, more easily transmissible to others. We haven't really seen a variant that's making people even more sick. But this increase of transmissibility concerns everybody because what we'd really like to do is if one person gets it, we can contain that virus to them without them transmitting to so many other different people. So you're going to hear about the South African, the South American, the, the UK variant, and quite honestly, it looks like we're growing our own variant out of California. 
And so the, all these variants are not one to two mutations, they're up to 25 mutations. And I do think that's why I think we're probably gonna be in this game for an extended period of time, because when they're changing that fast, <clears throat> I think the rational mind would say, we might not have complete vaccine protection you know, from all these variants. Anything you guys would change with that, Danielle? No, just to add, I mean, since the beginning of this, you know, it hasn't ever been that we're going to try to make it so nobody gets the, the virus. It's hard to stop a virus that can transmit so easily, right? So the whole point behind all of this is to help slow the spread so then you don't have as many hospitalizations and deaths. Yeah, and, and folks, I got to tell you, we, <clears throat> we suck at treating viruses. You know, I would say this is not something that that is great. We're great at bacteria. We've got more antibiotics which treat bacteria than Carter's got pills. But for viruses, we're not so good. We have learned a lot lately. We learned a lot actually with HIV. It's a different type of virus, but we learned a lot about <clears throat> what we can do to augment the immune system so the virus doesn't come in. But even something as simple as a common cold, once you get that virus, you've got that virus in your body pretty much for the duration. And and your body just holds it in check. And so the problem with viruses is we don't always completely kill it. We just get control of it and it just becomes not an issue. So for right now in 2021, if somebody comes in with a common cold, the best thing I've got for them is vitamin C. That, that's really kind of helps to augment their immune system so that they go from a five day illness to a three day illness. Now, I had a great question the other day. It's like, all right, John, if coronavirus is a common cold, you know, and so I get this coronavirus or I get the vaccine, am I going to be protected against the common cold? And, you know, that made me thought, and I was like, you know, I think, I think you will have some protection because most of our annual colds are coronaviruses. For example, I gave blood six months ago, right? And so after giving blood, they check your body for coronavirus, and they called me five days later and said, John, you got coronavirus. And I was like, well, I guess that's great because I'm, 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 I must have had coronavirus. And then they called me two days later and said, you, well, it's a coronavirus, but it wasn't COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2. And so I was like, okay. So then I just, whatever I was sick with last February was a coronavirus, but it wasn't SARS too. And so the hope is, and the thought is that the vaccinations and or the coronavirus are all part of this coronavirus family that makes us ill every year. And so I do think, you know, that we're protecting ourselves with either disease or the vaccinations, but quite honestly, what we're really protecting ourselves with are these masks and this hand washing and a little bit of social distancing and probably, probably just some behaviors that we probably needed to change a long time ago, right? It used to be a badge of courage to come into work and I'm sick, but I'm gonna tough it out, right? Now it's just like, that's just unkind right? Because the things I'm putting other people at risk for is, is not the thing to do. And quite honestly, when I heard initially that, all right, John, after you donated blood, you had some coronavirus antibodies, I was devastated because I remember being sick in February. And I remember being, I'm not so sick that I would miss work and I came to work. And so it's like, you know, that would have just devastated me if I gave other people coronavirus here at work. So I would tell you that I think those are some of the behaviors that, that we're gonna change in the long run and it's gonna help us. And boy, I tell you what, it's helped us this year on influenza. I mean, so we have really not seen much flu. By this time of the year, we should be seeing quite a bit of flu. And so the one thing that we can get confidence in the 30 to 60,000 Americans that die every year from flu, to be honest, we realized that, you know, with some behaviors and hand washing and masking, we may be able to obliterate that at a, at a much better level than just our vaccination rate. So how will these vaccinations be added to the immunization electronic record? So anytime we give a vaccination, we put it into the what's called WER, the Wisconsin Immunization Registry, and it's in there. And anybody who's got an electronic health record has generally got it in there as well. But right now, when you get a vaccine, right now, you get a little card from the CDC that says, hey, I got Pfizer, I got Moderna, maybe in a couple of weeks, you'll have J&J. &J. And so you'll have a vaccination record. Are these vaccination records gonna be enough to do international travel? I don't know yet. I mean, right now, international travel, I mean, there's a, 
you know, there's a um, PCR test in Chicago here. There's PCR tests in Minneapolis. And if you're traveling, they want to test before you go. And usually 72 hours after you get someplace, they want a confirmatory test that you're still not sick. And so we'll put it all into the Wisconsin Immunization Registry. But I will tell you that if you get a vaccine, make sure you get a card that says, hey, this is the vaccine that I got. It may be relevant in the future to say, hey, it looks like Johnson & Johnson protects you from this and Pfizer protected you from this and Moderna protects you from this. We may have a strategy with the rest of these vaccines as years to come that we may mix and match them. But for right now, it goes in the Wisconsin Immunization Registry. Um, what's the typical ramp up time after receiving the, the second dose until the immunity is in fact? Well, you start to get a, a, a dose after the first dose. And so we, had a, we have a couple of geeks, right, that we run around and so, we had somebody get a shot. And so they started checking their antibodies the very next day, right? With this home antibody test. And it's a fairly crude test, but it says positive or negative, right? So if you got, if it's positive, it's gonna spike positive and you're gonna know that you've got protection against COVID antibodies. And so they got their vaccine and it was a Pfizer vaccine and, a, and it was negative, 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 negative until about day 14 and then it turned positive. And so everybody's immune system's different. With them, but for sure, when you get that shot, you know most people have a sore arm. Some people have a little kind of chills, and about fifteen percent of them have fevers. But I would tell you, the fact of the matter is, your immune system is doing something for sure. But when you actually check the antibodies, what we saw in the literature is you get some protection even after that first dose. And 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 for the people that have totally geeked out on us, they've been measuring their own immune response, and it's right around that fourteen days after the first dose when they're really starting to see antibodies for COVID. We still recommend that second dose <clears throat> at 21 days for Pfizer and 28 days for Moderna. And that's not a CDC recommendation. That's the, the, the manufacturers trying to figure out what's the best way to give this vaccine. And when they did their phase one and phase two studies, that's what they were studying is how much of a dose do we need to give? How far out should we spread it? And where does it give its maximum effect? And so that's what the companies came out with. And, and that's the protection. Kim, anything you would add to that? Dr. Newman, if I can just actually, Kim, go ahead if there's something to add. And I have a question regarding vaccination. So I wanted to step that. So Kim, anything to add with? No, and if you wanted just to, are you gonna read the question in the chat? Yes, I am. Okay. So the, the question in the chat is, speaking of Johnson & Johnson, is that the one with less than 50% accuracy? And if so, what does that mean for the people getting that one? Do you have an option of, do you have an option of choosing one with higher, I can't say the word, efficacy? Did I say that right? Yep. Kim, you wanna tackle that one? That's a good one. <laughs> You know, we don't know a whole lot about Johnson & Johnson. You know, we are hearing it. Um, it is a one dose um, and doesn't have to be kept at cold temperatures such as the Pfizer. Um, so having it be the one dose, you know, is, is easier when it comes to distributing it. Um, not having as high um, of a percentage as the Moderna and Pfizer, you know, that is what I'm hearing. I'm not hearing that from the state at this time. Um, I think once it becomes more of a reality um, that it is likely to be out very soon, you know, we um, at the local level will get more information, you know, as far as, you know, what, what those actual numbers are. Um, Dr. Newman, do you know any other details on the Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a pertinent issue. The reality is this, people are asking fundamental question, what's the best vaccine I can get? And the answer is the soonest one you can get. Mm -hmm. But the soonest one you can get is Johnson & Johnson, get it, all right? Because the benefits of it, of, of having at least an 85 protection from you getting into the hospital is still a huge benefit. And so I think that people are gonna kind of nuance, and I've even had a few people think, oh, I think I want Pfizer, or I think I want Moderna. I would say there's nothing overwhelming in the literature that would say this is you know, the, definitely the best one. And anybody who calls me, I said, whatever you can actually get, get in line and get it. The, the this vaccine you can get is the one to give. The thing about Johnson and Johnson and the way that it's you know preserved and we don't have to super cool it or do this, we may be able to give that even into some doctor's offices in the rural areas. And so I, I worry a little bit that we've concentrated a lot of our vaccine centers 
around the cities. And, and, and so that may actually give a great benefit to people who, who can't get access to the, to, the, to the vaccine centers. And we got you know, 300 million people to vaccinate just in this country. And so I would just say, don't know yet with, um, could you? Yeah, I think you're intelligent enough to say, I know that, you know, Kim's given Pfizer down in Fond du Lac, John's given Moderna and Oshkosh and, and over here at the Sunny View Expo next week, they're doing Johnson and Johnson. Absolutely, you can be savvy enough, but I think that the smart thing to do would be get the the, the, the soonest vaccine that you can actually get in to see. So if you get an invite, I would take that invite and I would get that vaccine. So here's a good question. Once I get the vaccine, do I still need to quarantine if I've been exposed? And the answer is yes, because we don't know about, you know, any of the other, you know, and, and so people that are getting the vaccine, we are still testing before like surgical procedures so, you know, I bet nobody here really knew how far that Q-tip could go down your nose when they test you for COVID, huh? And it's like, that can't be natural that it goes in that deep. But, um, but we're still testing people even after vaccination because one of the questions we have is, all right, so yes, could there still be any asymptomatic folks out there after the vaccination? And we don't know the answer to that until we really get to the answer to that. If you've been exposed, I would certainly kind of protect yourself and the people around you until you know. And so I, I would say there's still a question period of which we don't have an infinitely great comfort because 10% of those people after vaccinations will still get sick. And if they're getting sick, then they actually can still communicate the disease. So I don't think any behaviors that got us to today, right now, we can't really change a whole lot of those behaviors for a good while until we build up confidence in what this vaccine is really going to do. Kim, you would offer anything different? You're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> no, um, you know, we are hearing from the state just that, you know, you will definitely need to quarantine still, you know, keeping your distance, face coverings, you know, all of those mitigation strategies that again, you know, we, we truly know do work. That vaccination is just one of those pieces. And until we can better understand, you know, what that looks like when it comes to, you know, somebody who, um, is fully vaccinated, was in contact with somebody who tests positive, you know, how likely is that um, that fully vaccinated person to hold on to the virus and to be able to pass that virus on, you know, from person to person? Maybe not, but we don't know those pieces yet. And so what if I'm exposed right after I received my first dose? Uh, you're likely to get COVID. I mean, we've we had a good friend of mine got her vaccine in the morning and she was just pumped. And that night she called me and she goes, man, I feel like crap, but this vaccine is really kicking my butt. And she had fevers and the next day she had fevers and I'm like, go get COVID tested. And she got tested and she got COVID the night of her vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's just bad luck, right? She did fine with them um, the span of it, but I've had somebody get COVID six days after the vaccine. So if, um, you know, I would not assume that you're really protected really until maybe two weeks after that second dose. Certainly the people that are measuring their antibodies, you know, there is some immune response. And so there will be some protection and not everybody in the Pfizer and the Moderna trials went to the second dose, right? Some people had reactions, some people got pregnant and we're like, gosh, what do we do, you know, with that? And some people decided not to get the second dose. And there was still a lot of protection after one dose. There's just more protection after the second dose. And while I'm at it, I'll go and address the, the fertility issue and, and whatnot. And this is what I heard an awful lot from the school districts and which you're probably hearing from questions. And, and I will tell you that there was a lot of disinformation. I would tell you one of the, the, the Pfizer, you know, physicians who, who left the company had a, had a grudge against the company. And, and I'll tell you what, started a pretty strong, you know, hey, don't get this vaccination because of the similarity between this spike protein and, and the, one of the proteins on the lining of a placenta. And, and while that was completely unvalidated, the question's not really legitimate. It's like, could there be a problem here? And all I can say is when we did the Pfizer and the Moderna studies, we had over 30 people get pregnant and it was 15 in the control arm that didn't get the vaccine and 15 in the vaccinated arm. So it didn't appear to be any difference amongst those 70,000 people. 
And nor are we seeing that on the back end here in the hospital. We're delivering pregnant moms all the time who have COVID, right? And so we're getting a lot of people who are now pregnant who had COVID six months ago. So it does not fundamentally appear that there's an effect on fertility for, for, for certainly women and, and what appears to be no impact on fertility in men, but we'll keep studying that. But I do know that that was a, a legitimate fear and concern. And I think right now, without a doubt, the maternal fetal societies, the American College of OBGYN, you know, even the pregnant moms and the breastfeeding moms, you know, they, they kind of say, don't delay the vaccine if you can. With, um, and so, and you'd rather not have, you know, COVID than the vaccine. Because this is really, when people ask me, John, what do you do? All I do is to say, it's two questions, right? Do you want COVID? Or do you want the vaccine? Pick one because you're going to get one of them in, over the span of the next couple of years. And without a doubt, there's no doubt in my mind as a, a, an overweight male approaching 60 that I don't want COVID. Those folks are not doing well done in our ICUs. And so it was a binary decision for me. Do I want COVID or do I want the vaccine? And same thing with our pregnant mom or breastfeeding mom. Now, I will say just last week, the World Health Organization came out and said, hey, you know, if, if you're pregnant, maybe don't get the vaccine just because we haven't studied it and we don't know. And the American College of GYN and Maternal Fetal Medicine did not accept that posture because they're seeing some significant, you know, fetal problems with COVID disease and a doubling of the maternal, meaning mom dies in childbirth, a doubling of that rate was, is, is unacceptable to them. So they're saying, just get the vaccine to protect yourself, mom and baby. And so a lot of those questions kind of arising, but I tell you what, it's a binary question. Do you want COVID or do you want the effects of the vaccine? Kim, Danielle, would you say anything different? I wouldn't. And we're seeing very few individuals, um, you know, have any effects whatsoever, sore arm. Yeah, I mean, you know you got a vaccine. I mean, if anybody's gotten the shingles vaccine, I don't think it was as bad as that. Shingles, you know, is, is one that kind of reliably people kind of just grudge and say, wow, that kicked my butt. But this one's going to hurt your arm. You're going to want to take a nap. And then when you wake up from your nap, you're pretty much over it. Mm -hmm. Once I get the vaccine, will I still need to mask in public? You know, I, you know, I could ask anybody on the phone here, Kathy, Jean, you know, Mary, Dustin, you know, what do you think? If we get the vaccine, do you think we're going to need to mask in public? I think we should continue to do it. It, it sends the right message, you know, to, you know, those people. It, it, I think it's just, a, it's a leadership position. It's an influence position. It's, um, you know, promoting the right behavior that, that we want to see in our communities and our workplaces. Yeah, because there's still a lot of other diseases out there that you don't want, folks. And I tell you what, I think the masking, the hand washing, and a little bit of the distancing is going to really still protect you. But without a doubt, I, I would say one of these variants could be problematic. And, and you don't want to be, you know, the one that's in the ICU dying because you didn't think about that risk. I, I think right now, I, I'm not sure, as somebody who's worked in a hospital for 30 years, I'm not so sure I'm going to ever be able to take my mask off in the hospital. And you know what's fascinating to me? I'm a general surgeon by trade, right? I think I some I calculated I'm probably off by plus or minus a couple thousand. I've done like 30, 36, 37,000 operations. Nobody has ever said, why in the world are you wearing a mask during those operations? Nobody's ever said, you know, gosh, you know, thank you for wearing a mask during that operation. And nor have I ever felt you know, gosh, I feel put out because I have to wear a mask in this operation. It has just made sense for 30 years for me to not only protect the patient from me, but to protect me from the patients. And, and, and I would just say that it, it hasn't been questioned for those aspects of surgery and medicine for eons since Christ was an intern. And, and, and now it's being brought up. I would just say that it's, it's a behavior that will protect people around us. It will protect us. But the most important thing that I worry about right now, our children haven't quite been protected yet. And so the, the mRNA vaccine studies are studying the children and to say, how can we protect them? Because they're the ones that got to deal with the sequela of COVID for their entire lives, right? I've probably only got, you know, if it doesn't kill me, 
maybe 20 years to, to, to live until, you know, my time has come. But how can we protect our kids around us and, and the younger people around us? Now, they're somewhat immune and, and don't have any fear, but the reality is we need to protect them too. And, and there's some things that could happen with this, this vaccine and it's things that happen from this disease that could make us scratch our heads and say, I wish we'd have done some difference. All right, any other questions, Bobby, that you got in the chat that we wanna ask about? Yes, this one is in regards to testing. So how many Binex Now rapid tests are we getting from the federal government today? And are we targeting daily testing for care workers to prevent the virus from hitting the most vulnerable groups? Um, I'll let Kim and Danielle talk about how many tests we're getting a day. This is an antigen test, is if I've got the name correctly. And so basically test to see if you've got kind of the antigen for the, the virus. We are not testing healthcare workers every day. What we have learned over the last year is that in the healthcare environment, we are not sharing this disease. We've had a few of our doctors and nurses come down with COVID and went home sick and tested positive, but they didn't share it with any of their patients or any of their coworkers. We've had patients who were sick that haven't shared it with any of our doctors and nurses. The times where we have had breaches, whether it be kind of departments, you know, you know, met after work and went to a party and somebody was sick. And, and even the stories in the hospital, the people that have COVID, they kind of know exactly where they got it from. And it, it, early on, it was a few weddings and a few funerals. And, and now it's kind of family gatherings. And, and, but I would tell you, there's very rare cases towards like, I don't know where I got it from. I, I have really been protecting myself. Most of the time, know where their exposures are. And so I would just say, that testing people, you know, if you have a concern and there's a hot spot, then test everybody to figure out where it's at and what's going on. But to test healthcare workers every day, I don't think we've got enough tests to really do that to make sense. And we've got enough confidence in our protect, personal protective gear that quite honestly, you know, even if Kim had COVID and she was taking care of me in the hospital, her wearing a mask, me wearing a mask and us both washing our hands, is, is pretty doggone protective. And so Kim, would you want to, want to ask a question about the Binex now and, and what kind of, maybe overall, just what kind of federal government support are we getting to tackle this disease? Yeah, okay, so in the realm of testing, um, when it comes to the rapid test, it's hard to really tangibly put a number to it because the way that we get those results in um, are through our Wisconsin Electronic Disease Surveillance System. And the way that they tweaked it and changed it is we get all positives and the negatives don't pop in there. And so the information that if you would go onto our website and see all of our data, the negative tests are actually information that we pull from DHS, the state. And those um, negative tests are reflective of PCR tests only. Um, so it's hard to tangibly put a number to how many um, those rapid antigen tests are out there. I am able to um, pull out how many positive antigen tests we are getting on like an average day, but only those positive ones are the reportable ones to the health department. Um, and that would be on average about, um, you know, 20, I would say 15 to 30 a day that we're getting. So if you would go onto our website um, right now on the metrics, you would see that they, we had 44 positive cases since Friday at 2 p.m. And that would be from yesterday at 2 p.m. So that three week, okay, Bobby's gonna share that information. So, so it would be a three day period of the confirmed test. All of the information on this dashboard is reflective of PCR. That would be that confirmatory test and not antigen tests. And so that 44 would be more uh, reflective of probably closer to 70. Um, and that would be including those antigen positive cases as well. From the health department standpoint, we take care of um, those we call them, you know, probable antigen tests. We um, take care of those just the same as we do a PCR confirmed individual. Um, the work is the same, the contact tracing is the same, um, but the tests are, are quite different. And I, I, I tangibly can't give a, a number to how many are out there. A lot of our skilled nursing facilities are using antigen tests and if an antigen 
test comes back positive, they will follow that up with a PCR test. All right, got a couple of good questions about very individualistic. So I'm gonna broaden this out. So if I've got a hematologic disease, maybe I've got ITP or maybe I've got a malignancy or pregnancy, you know, should I get the vaccine? And across the board, most of the providers are saying absolutely get the vaccine because COVID would be worse, but have those conversations with your doctors. One of the, the questions is about what if I have allergies? What if I have allergies to bee stings or nickel or not? Probably the only true allergy that I'd be worried one is one with polyethylene glycol, which is the good bowel valproxid or, or even kind of Miralax has got polyethylene glycol. So if people can't tolerate that and they get irritation on their skin, then those are the ones that we're a little bit more careful with as far as do that. My recommendation, if you have bad allergies, is make sure that you get your vaccine in a hospital type setting right? Because you, you want to be close by to the emergency care if you need it. And we have had a couple, I would say, you know, a couple fainting reactions, which we kind of see when you give a bunch of shots, right? But one, one particular one had 30 previous anaphylactic reactions uh, to every vaccine she's ever gotten. And guess what? You know, she had a reaction to this one, but we treated it, right? So she wanted it and she treated it. And now she's debating on whether or not she wants to get the second dose. And and so the polyethylene glycol, the polysorbate, true allergies, which are rare, rare, rare hen's teeth, they were the ones that I would consider maybe not getting. But everybody else, I would still say, you know, I would still consider getting it and a bee, a bee allergy reaction. And this is where I think we as in the healthcare setting differ just a little bit with some of the folks in public health to where they'll say, you know, if you've had a bad reaction, you know, maybe don't get it. We're a little more comfortable saying, hey, if we're in the health setting, Let's put you right next to you. We're two minutes away from the emergency room. We've got epinephrine, Benadryl, and let's go ahead and give you the vaccine. So Kim, I, I think the health departments are a little bit different in, in the, the contraindications from allergies, but if I've had an anaphylactic reaction to my first COVID vaccine, I think that's probably the best reason to not have it, you know, to not get the second one. And we define that as a no kidding reaction within four hours after the vaccine, but most of those reactions we'll see within kind of zero to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we did a really uh, pretty big clinic last week, Wednesday. We did over 1,200 individuals. Not a single one of them had a reaction, but um, we do screen everybody. And then we have medical personnel there as well um, that helps determine um, the difference between waiting 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And a lot of the individuals that waited the 30 minutes had um, some type of an allergy. Um, and we just wanted to monitor them a little bit closer. And nobody had a reaction out of all those individuals, which was really good. So we've taken, we're taking care of currently the 65 and older, which is not an insignificant mass of people. And the hope is we're going to get through them in February. And then we get to our teachers and other kind of essential workers in March. And, and this gets stratified out by the, the state's, you know, health team to really say, this is who's next, this is who's next. And we just basically, the next person in line gets an invite and we vaccinate them. And so how are they gonna delineate essential workers? You know, I can't say that I have the, the best idea, but I, I imagine they're gonna come out in layers and Kim, you probably got a better idea for this with them. But I would say, that with um, the cost for the employers and the employees for this is the vaccine, you guys already paid for it, right? It, it got paid for by your taxes. So there's nothing about Pfizer and Moderna that was, you know, in their altruistic benefit. It was our tax dollars that got put into those companies to make these vaccines for the purpose of this is the quickest way for us to get a vaccine that we can deliver. So you've already paid for it with your tax dollars. But so right now we are not getting charged for the vaccine and nor are we charging for the vaccine. I think if we get to where there's a possibility of capturing an administration fee, the administration fees for getting shots is somewhere on par of $18. And so I would say that's right there. But I think right now we're just trying to get as many needles and as many arms. And, and so we're obviously our commitment to the CDC as health systems is we will not be charging people that don't have the ability to pay. We will not be charging people that don't have health insurance. But if they do have health insurance, then I would say then the health insurance company can help us out a little bit because the health departments are, are spending a lot of money. The partnerships with the universities and the 
the other health systems are losing a lot of money. And so I would say if any of the health insurances can at least cover an administration fee, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask, but those are the numbers that I've been told to me, but I don't even know if anybody's been charged them yet. So Kim, can you talk a little bit more about how we layer off the kind of the, the, the employees and the essential workers in the times to come? Yeah, Bobby, do you wanna share the rollout? And I think Dr. Newman, this is what you would be kind of getting at, would be what are we planning to do for those next phases? Is that correct? Correct. And so March 1st is the hopes, but March 1st, I would say currently, in my opinion, this is John Newman speaking, is, is a little optimistic until we've got enough vaccine to get through all of our 65 and older. And so if something doesn't change with our vaccine supply, I don't see how I can get through the 65 and older between now and March 1st. So mm -hmm. I think it's fair to tell people on this phone that we want to get to our teachers, we want to get to the essential workers, but I also think that the prioritization of the 65 and older, I think was a smart one, and those are the people that will benefit the most. But if something doesn't fundamentally change with our vaccine supply, I don't see how we're going to be done with our 65 and older by March 1st. So I, I think it's okay to share people. It's like, we're going to get to the next group when this group is done. And, and so if it's sooner than March 1st, we're going to get to it sooner. But if, if we don't have the vaccine to get through the 65 and older, then, then that's when we're going to get to it. Yeah. And when the state did put that out, they definitely said it was really based on vaccine availability. Um, what we're dealing with at the, the state, the state's dealing with it. So then if the state's dealing with it, us at the local level, all hospitals are dealing with this where you know, every week, it's a week by week allocation. So if I'm going to ask for a vaccine today, I'm going to find out how much vaccine I'm going to be getting Friday or Saturday. And then I will have that vaccine delivered to me Monday or Tuesday. And I have to use it within five days, especially if it's Pfizer. Even if it's Moderna, they want you to use whatever you're asking for within that next week. So it makes it really difficult to plan, especially if you plan a big clinic for a thousand people and you are told you're getting only 500 doses. And across the board, um, they're probably um, getting requests from hospitals and local health departments like fourfold of what they're actually receiving. So they have to follow a very intricate allocation process and algorithm on how they determine who gets what vaccine. And as Dr. Newman mentioned, um, you know, the 65 and older group is a very big group. I believe it consists for Wisconsin of about 700,000 individuals. Um, I did 1,200, um, you know, 65 and olders. Yes, uh, last week, Wednesday, but actually not all of them are 65 and older. I'm still, you know, filling in whenever I possibly can. Um, the phase 1A folks that kind of keep trickling in phase 1A, um, can be a very um, concrete phase, but then you also have um, healthcare workers that are unaffiliated, you know, and it's difficult to sometimes tangibly reach out to them. And so we are having individuals, you know, on a regular basis trickle in. My plan is to fill them in in the clinics that I that I have as we move forward. Um, so the now phase that we're in is the 65 and older. Um, and my plan will be once we have the teachers, hopefully it's at that point where we're slowing down with the 65 and older. It's hard to find 65 and olders to fill the clinics. And now then maybe we, you know, we fill it then with the teachers. And so each phase, I see it as kind of fluid. You're not going to necessarily have a hard stop on one phase to have a you know, a hard stop on the next phase, it will just continue to phase as long as we get that approval from the state. I do know for Fond du Lac County, um, we're pretty much done with phase 1A. Um, this week, tomorrow, um, we have another big clinic. Our, um, our goal again is about 1200 individuals. And I believe that would be the last of our phase 1A folks that we've, we've hit in there. And the majority of those folks in the clinic for tomorrow are those 65 and older. Police and fire that was um, put um, on our radar to do from the state, I think was probably on January 18th. And we have successfully gotten all of those individuals um, into clinics already. 
And so it's just a matter of, you know, getting a good chunk of our 65 and older done. Um, and hopefully it would be, you know, at a good time point when they do open it up for um, our educators, which would be that next phase. So great question here from an employers who want to offer on-site vaccine clinics, which I would tell you is great. My, my only concern with that is there are so many rules associated with Pfizer and Moderna right now that, I mean, you've got to have a lockable freeze, freezer to minus 100 for Pfizer. And then you also have to have a lockable fridge because once you thought out any vaccine you don't use goes in the fridge, it's got to be enclosed in a locked in area under 24 seven camera vigilance that you can review and you've got to have a plan that in case the power goes out, what are you going to do to manage that vaccine? So this is as close to Fort Knox as we're ever going to get. With them. What I actually see happening is once we get through these big waves of 1B and 1C to say, all right, how can we get out to our kind of employers and how can we partner with you to create these mobile vaccine clinics to where we can make it a little bit more effective? Because currently there's, there's obviously a lot more people wanting the vaccine than there is vaccine. And we've got a no dose left behind theory. And so each of these vials has either 10 or five and, and basically, if, if we can't use this in any way that we're going to waste the vaccine, maybe once we get well into the end of the summer, that people will be less cognizant about wasting vaccine. But I would say right now that I'm not even sure I can consistently meet all the requirements being placed on me by the CDC to run a vaccination clinic. And I'm just hoping the power never goes out. But, but I would tell you that right now, it is arduous, but you can go to the DHS website and talk about vaccine enrollment, read through kind of the, the things, take the training on, on transferring and storing vaccine and ask yourself, I think this is something we can do because honestly, we, we'd like all the help we can get, you know, the hopes of CVS and Walgreens of, of helping us out, you know, it's still out there. The health departments are doing the best we can. We're leveraging national guards all across and the health systems are still pretty much taking a lot of this as we continue to run the, the, the vaccinations. And, and honestly, you're still having a few reactions. So you need to be in a position to where you can manage those reactions safely because the question that gets posed is, I don't know if I'm gonna take the risk. Well, out of whatever 40 million vaccines that have been given in America, nobody's died from them yet. But we have almost 4,000 people dying a day of COVID. So that's my binary decision of COVID versus COVID vaccines. Um, great one on temperature screening. You know, I don't know about you, Kim, but I tell you what, I don't have a whole lot of faith in the fidelity of temperature screening. With um, certainly during the winter when we're bringing people in from immediately from outside and get a temperature. I mean, if anything, we've got an epidemic of hypothermia. People coming in with temperatures of 92 that is really not completely consistent with life, right? So. I appreciate the question of what's the value of temperature screening. Um, I, I guess the question I would have for you is, I mean, if, if you're not gonna mask your visitors and, and they're just gonna be running about and, and they were infected, would you want to have known their temperature? So I would say universal screening, I think temperature offers you a little bit, but I can count on one hand out of all of our employers and all of the visit employees and all of our visitors to the hospital, how many times somebody was positive from a temperature screen and sent away. But mm -hmm. I'm comforted that to know we probably missed a lot in a way because everybody's wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I know what you have to say, but what? tell me, what do you think? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree with that actually. And I've said that in several, um, you know, when, when we have businesses call because they ask, you know, what, you know, how important is that? And I said, you know, really what it does is it gives a false sense of security. You know, somebody screens out, okay, well, they're great. They're not infectious. When in reality, they could be at their most infectious period a couple of days prior to the onset of symptoms. And if one of their symptoms happens to be a fever, you know, that's going to capture, you know, that. But yeah, you know, I, I think it, it, it provides a visual for an individual walking into an establishment to say, okay, you know, they're, they're temperature checking, um, they're taking, they're taking this seriously, they must be doing other things to also protect us. You know, I think it's, it's definitely a visual, but um, it does provide that false sense of security, which worries me, you know, 
everybody needs to continue to wear a mask because that's going to ultimately, you know, protect somebody from, you know, getting whatever that person may have and they don't even realize it. A lot of great questions about making this vaccination mandatory. I, I my, this is John's opinion again. We have made influenza vaccinations mandatory in our organization annually, just because we do know the asymptomatic spread. And quite honestly, we know that we can really protect people from flu. This is released under emergency use authorization. And it's not even FDA approved, folks. I think it will get FDA approved. I think the data is accumulating and it will be an approved vaccine. But I would say, I think we're years before anybody says, you must take this vaccine as an employer. To, to say that we've got the science and the FDA in support. But I can honestly see that if, if we, our biggest trouble in September and October, November was yes, we had a swarm of sick patients coming in, but what really put us in a vulnerable position was we had lost almost 25 to 30% of our staff who was either out for quarantine or out for illness of COVID. I think we're managing the quarantine a little bit better for these essential workers to say, hey, if you're feeling okay, your mask anyway, we're going to check you several times for the next seven to 10 days to make sure that you don't develop any symptoms with COVID and, and, and keep them in the workforce. But I would say that I don't see us anywhere this year for sure to where we're going to mandate a vaccine. And certainly we wouldn't mandate a vaccine that's not FDA approved yet. So I, I think it's a great question, but I think we've got a whole lot more to learn before anybody would be comfortable saying, oh, there's a mandate to get a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Anything different on that one? No, I think there are some entities such as skilled nursing facilities that, you know, have tried to walk down that road to see, um, you know, if, if it is even possible. And I think the easiest answer is, um, can, can you make this vaccine mandatory, even if it's under that EUA? And I think the soft answer to that would be yes, but I think there is a lot of uh, additional red tape under that. And I'm not aware of, um, you know, any hospital system um, that has, you know, cho chosen to go down that road to, you know, make it mandatory for any of their employees. Personally, my employees, you know, it is a voluntary process. There have been a few hospitals that have pushed in this and mm -hmm. we expect you to get it, but they haven't totally enforced it and certainly right. terminated people because they didn't get it. And so it's, and we, we get a little bit of that with influenza with some of the exemptions with them, but I think it is what it is. I think that mm -hmm. we'll learn more about this to say, could this be something we would mandate? All right, and travel, right? Can I fly in the United States without having a negative test if I show proof of the vaccination? I would say wherever you're going, you need to do a little research because this is the wild, wild west. If you want to go to Hawaii, you better read up on it because you're going to need to have a test before you get on that plane. You're going to need to have a test 72 hours after you get on that plane. And you're going to have the National Guard coming in to make sure you don't leave your hotel within an hour before you should versus if you want to fly to somewhere else in the country, may not be those restrictions. So the United States has a lot of variations and the states do have control over this. So they have the perfect right to say, this is what we want to do. And so do the research if you're going someplace. I would say I personally feel very comfortable traveling in a plane, the way they're recycling the air, the way they filter their air. I mean, it would be bad luck if I'm sitting in front of somebody that's got COVID and hacking and they're not with infidelity wearing their mask right? That's the people I'd be more worried about, you know, not the people that are, you know, more than six feet away, the air is being circulating. I'm not worried about the circulating air. It's going to be the people that I'm in close proximity to. But when I'm traveling, and I've had to travel a couple of times, I'm wearing a mask. There's no way I'm not going to wear a mask during the travel. And so any other travel advisories you got, Kim? No, um, if there is any new information from the um, from the CDC or um, from the state when it comes to travel, um, you know, within Wisconsin or um, internationally, we do have all of that information on our website. Actually, all of our information for that fact, um, it, it just stays. The most up-to-date information we have is on our website. If we're going to be changing a process or if um, there's something that was changed at the CDC or state, or we have to put a press release out about something, we always change our website first. Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> Do you
Did you want me to go into any of them specifically or just show all of the yeah, so if you if you get onto this site, whatever computer you have, you just be aware that you can keep scrolling down. And um, you know, one of these, oh it's yeah, so there's a lot of information. There is a little button if you go up just a little bit more. Oh, okay, down. Oh, down. Oh, a little more there. So travel and frequently asked questions. So if there's any new information, you know, that um, comes out from the CDC, we make sure we add that here. But again, as Dr. Newman mentioned, every state is going to have different requirements if they have them. So you need to check with what state you're going to. All right. Well, Bobby, anything else in the chat that the, the folks felt they, 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 they needed answered? Because I think we got through the, 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 the questions for the safety council. There, there was one question, and I would direct that specifically to you, Dr. Newman, um, regarding hospitals. Um, question was from Jean. Will the testing as it continues change the fact that we will be able to visit our family when they are in the hospital? Yeah, so right now, I think with not only the percent positive and, and all the testing that's going on and the amount of COVID burden that we have in our hospitals, we need to be a little sensitive that we have, you know, we, we spiked earlier than the rest of the state, you know, in Northeast Wisconsin. So we came down earlier. So we have requested certainly with an advocate or a health system to say, hey, could we please consider at least a, a limited access. So zero, you know, visitation has just been, gosh, it's been hard for doctors. It's been hard for nurses. And gosh knows it's hard for patients. Now we have done with some creative things about how to virtually do them, but I've got people on the other side of glass in intensive care unit when their family members are dying of COVID. And it, I cannot tell you that that is the one thing that I don't think our doctors and nurses and your families and the patients are going to just be able to forget. That's, that's going to haunt us for a while. I do think it was the safest thing to do, but we're now at a point where we have asked for, can we at least have limited visitation uh, of really one or two folks that can visit folks. And so end of life, we've still got the limited visitation to come on in, but not for COVID positive, right? And so we haven't had anybody come in with COVID positive to give it to even a heart failure patient who's struggling with end of life and give them COVID, right? So our, our visitation has protected our patients in when we can, but but boy, nobody, nobody likes these visitation restrictions. And so we have, we are appealing across the state and as a system, I would say Advocate of Rural Health is really saying, all right, I think it's time to at least move to a limited visitation. But I, I hear the question and I just, I tell you what, those are the things that when I look back is to say, gosh, how could we have done that any different? Because you know, other than having, you know, my nurse in the room or the, the physicians in the room at, during the end of life, you know, if I'm dying of COVID, it's like it, it, it this is going to have long term sequela for all of us involved. So we're trying if that answered that question. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn everything back to Joe so he can give some closing comments. Um, I personally want to thank the three of you for taking time to do that and everybody else also. Hopefully it was beneficial. I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything much to add. I just really appreciate our uh, knowledge experts here today. Uh, Dr. Newman, Kim, Danielle, for being on the call, and uh, all of you for attending. If there are uh, if there are things that you feel you, you wanted to ask but you weren't able, uh, I, I imagine we're going to have another session uh, similar to this. So stay tuned from the Safety Council. We will have uh, you know future coffee talks like this where we can have a little bit more discussion with participants. Uh, as we know, the situation keeps evolving. So. It's always good for us to be sharing information and uh, learning from one another in the safety community. So once again, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining in on the call and uh, have a great week. Thanks for the invite. Thank you.